Um, yeah, this is the um, Open Global Mind weekly call on Thursday, March 30th, uh, 2023. And Pete and I are just talking about this, the singularity uh, or possibilities of a singularity or whatever else. Um, but but if you want to say it like all mankind has been bootstrapping towards some kind of singularity, then you lose you lose the notion that the singularity might be a special moment. No. Well, the the way Vinci said it is he said it's an exponential curve, right? So, hmm. um, even the technology of a hundred years ago to somebody from two thousand years ago would be like unimaginable, right? And, and was part of the on ramp. Yeah. <laughs> makes sense <laughs> makes sense in, so, in similar so are we there uh we've <laughs> I, my point I, my point is we've been there for um a while <laughs> for a couple thousand years yeah and it's so, it's going to get more weird and faster but it's you know it's so if my showing my great grandparents you know zoom um it'd be like you know what <laughs> How does that work? Yeah, how, I mean, how but, would I extrapolate from Zoom to the next thing? I I don't understand this thing. It doesn't make sense. Um, but also, isn't the singularity that that moment after which we don't really know what things are like and how things necessarily work or will be? And in that sense, have we not yet passed through it? Or what do you it's, mean? Well, it's not a moment. It's it's a curve. It's an exponential curve. But isn't there a transition at some point in that curve where things feel different and strange? It, it's been feeling that way for you know a couple hundred years. Ah, Pete and I are talking about the singularity, and I was I was proposing that we may be slipping through the singularity now. And Pete was like, "We've been doing that for tens of thousands of years, mm, um, thousands at least." Okay. Can uh, you say what you mean by singularity? So, Werner, it, go ahead. It actually means a couple different things, uh, which is one of the things you have to watch out for. But um, yeah. as science fiction author uh, Werner Vinci um, said, uh, at some point, technological advances are going to be coming fast enough that we won't know what's coming next. We won't be able to imagine what's coming next. And and so most so so then really. You know, within five or ten years after that, people have kind of expanded it to to mean different things. Oh, the singularity is when there's artificial general intelligence. Um, oh, the singularity is when artificial intelligence, general intelligence, has taken over from humans. I, you know, they they kind of slice and dice in different ways. Vinji was a little bit more general. Um, and I haven't read up on the varieties of singularity. The, the one I've sort of focused on most is the technological singularity. There could also be a biological singularity and probably other visions. I, don't, I haven't sort of done a compare and contrast. That would be a really nice prompt for ChatGPT, actually. <laughs> um, C, and I'm just illustrating that we may, like, this This may be a piece of, of what's up. It's like, like our separation from the machines, our dependencies on it, all those good things are kind of hot on the burner these days. Um, and it's exciting. So we are, this this week is a check-in week um, by way of process check-in on OGM. Last week, we had an exciting call about uh, Pete's proposal to create, to write a book or something like that. I think of it as Andy Rooney and uh, Judy Garland saying, let's put on a show. <laughs> Um, which may be a terrible reference for most. I think that's Mickey room. Rooney. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. Mickey Rooney. Yeah. Andy, Andy, ever, ever Andy bother Rooney with the, all those old movies? You know. Yeah. Oh my god, <laughs> that's embarrassing. Yeah. He was the first Rooney that came to mind. Lucky I didn't say um, uh, what's her name, Mara, uh, the new uh, the actress. Uh, and we Whatever. now know Ken is an impressionist. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Rooney Mara. Sorry, Rooney Mara. It's not, not her first name. It's her last name. Uh, she was in uh, The Social Network, Carol, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
Hey, kids, let's put on 60 minutes. Exactly. Well, that sounds like an exciting evening. <laughs> um, and, so, uh, and so I think how this is evolving is that we are repurposing the Monday sense doing calls to be this book like project, which where, and Pete, correct me as I, as I misrepresent this, um, where the book is just the surface representation of something that is familiar to normal people, to civilians, uh, to muggles, as I like to call them. The book is a gateway drug uh, to get people interested and connected into the thing that is online that is much more interesting and is woven into conversations like this one, uh, is woven into resources, is woven into everything that that you could possibly want. So we're we're sort of busily thinking about what to call this thing and organizing that. If you'd like to join those conversations, join us on Mondays at 10.30 a.m. in this same Zoom. Uh, and we're, we're, we're having those conversations. Pete, anything to add to that? Uh, so maybe we'll chat in SenseDoing, the SenseDoing channel as well. And uh, on Mattermost, there's the SenseDoing channel, which we will <clears throat> turn to this. Uh, this purpose as well. So if you're curious, go monitor that channel and we'll probably rename the channel to whatever we rename the project. Um, any questions on that before I turn over to sense to, to check in mode? Here, when did you say when did you say that meeting was? Uh, Mondays at 1030 Pacific <laughs> standing call. Yeah. Uh, and we'll usually run through noon, so 90 minutes. Um, thanks, Pete. So um, we are on a check-in schedule today. So let me um, go through the rules of the SOGM check-in protocol. Which, uh, and one thing we've not been doing all that well during uh, the SOGM protocol is distinguishing between the check-in portion of the call and the more freeform discussion part of the call. Uh, and the idea here is that during the check-in place, the, the check-in portion, we go relatively briskly so that everybody has a chance to, to put something in the room. Uh, we can aim high. Uh, Doug's question is what, uh, what is the question? Uh, actually, I don't wanna misrepresent it. So let me go to the Doug protocol. Uh, the focusing question Doug recommends is what is on your mind that is worthy of serious conversation? So we could elevate uh, our, our question for check-ins that way, or we could just check in with what is up with you that's OGM-like and OGM-related. Uh, I'm open for whatever people would like here. Uh, raise, your, raise your electronic Zoom hand when you are moved to jump in and check in. Uh, before you speak, take a pause and take a pause of whatever length you want. The silence helps us process. Don't lower your Zoom hand until after you've spoken so that you kind of stay in place for us and maybe unmute yourself to indicate that you, you know that you're ready to go and uh, you're just pausing. You're just having that moment of silence as it goes. Uh, and then after, after we finish the check-in round, uh, we will then just participate uh, in sort of more a more normal way, but continue the pausing. The pausing is really nice. Don't expect me to pass the mic. So if you're next in the hand queue, please uh, step in the way I just described. And um, another another variable we have here is um, whether or not to use the chat during check-ins. Um, I like the chat as a way for us to sort of uh, share resources, do whatever as the check-ins happen, as, as things come up. So I would vote for um, letting the chat be free form during the check-in round and certainly for the rest of the call, uh, but I'm open to a group vote or or like if a lot of people would rather, um, I, I think of, I think of making the chat off limits as a way of kind of sanctifying the conversation or creating more attention. Uh, which is, uh, as I said, a, a variable for us to tweak in terms of what we do. So um, if you feel strongly that we should um, turn off the chat during the call, please raise your hand right now and your, your physical hand in the monitor. Okay, so let's, let's let the chat go uh, during the check-in. Um, go once during the check-in round. So once you've checked in, uh, step aside. Uh, I will ping at some point later for who, you know, who's missing or who's not gone or who's going to pass. 
and then I'll shift us into conversational mode as we go. Um, and yeah, Pete's put up the link to my brain for the different check-in protocols, which I, I, I was like, wait, we should organize this a little bit. So there we are. Um, and so Doug, you have your hand up. I will step uh, to the sidelines and mute myself and see who wants to check in and go from here. Thank you. So one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately is our tendency to make new relationships. Uh, certainly startups do, do that, uh, moving into a new community, we look for people to be connected to. The problem for humanity is that the more relationships we create, the more we're weaving a tight space that makes it hard to move until uh, uh, ultimately we have so filled up the human space uh, with ideas, the idea space, that it's not possible to do anything new. And maybe that's human fate, that our ability to reproduce and to be curious and to make relationships is going to lock us in eventually to total immobility intellectually. End of thought. Yeah, so when I heard Doug say that, I chose to check in because what was actually on my mind is I was going yesterday, um, Pete and I discussed maybe having a little group where we played with chat GPT. And the reason I bring that up is because what I've been doing is finding many ways in different groups to connect with just specific people within those groups that are interested in those specific things. And in that way, I find that there's always an intermingling of different people. In any group I go to, I usually find one or two people I know, and there's a flow. And it turns out we're connected usually, well, for me, I have a certain value that I'm always looking for. So I always find that specific connection. With other people, I suppose it would be different things. But I think there is a way to do what Doug is talking about is, is needed without siloing. But I think it requires really showing up as who you are so that not only how you behave is how you behave everywhere, but what you're truly interested in and passionate about is coming from a real place. Not mm -hmm. that you're stretching to be something different than who you are, because that's only going to last up until a certain point. So I hope that's understandable. But anyway, if you're interested in having conversations with chat GPT in a group of playing around, we're looking to maybe do that and see how it works out. I'm reminded of one of my inspirations long ago, a friend, a colleague of mine noticed I was feeling blue after a breakup and he said, hey, uh, the, the missus and the, the kids and I are going to Quaker meeting. And I'm like, what, what, what's that? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I attended Wilton meeting in Connecticut for a couple of years before moving into New York City. And once I got used to it, which happened very quickly, I just acclimated and, you know, it was like a duck in water. Um, I would arrive a little bit early, like not, I wouldn't be there before the greeter. And there's a rotating role as the, the greeter who welcomes people and notices new people and gives them a little pamphlet to explain the process kind of thing. But I would go sit down and I would sit down across the room and Quaker meetings generally are not decorated with any religious paraphernalia of any kind. Our meeting room had a beautiful big fireplace and in appropriate weather, uh, the first person in or one person would get in pretty early and stoke the fire. And so we would have a crackling fire through the whole thing and it would be beautiful outside. There were nice windows. And I would then watch as the members of the meeting came in. And um, and it was sort of a, like, it was a, well, <laughs> that's very funny. I was about to say it was like a religious experience, but wait, I was in service. Okay, so it was a religious experience. 
um, but it was beautiful. And, and there was one, uh, uh, one fellow who would always come with his son and they would take the same bench and his son would sort of lie down on the bench and put his head in, in, in his dad's lap and they would sit there. And this meeting's practice was that the first 15 minutes kids could be in. And then at the 15 minute mark, there'd be a quiet moment where one, one adult would get up and the kids would all get up and sort of file out and go, go play a couple rooms down uh, for their version of whatever Sunday school might be. And it was just beautiful. It was a lovely, lovely thing. I, I missed the, the routine of it. And then I was recently going through um, uh, time capsules and old documents and things like that. And I found uh, I worked for New Science Associates when I was in Connecticut. So this this is kind of contemporary to that time. I found a report I wrote in 1988. <clears throat> so I'm not the youngest fellow around, but uh, called Neural Networks Prospects for Commercial Use. And I I was leafing through it, going, okay, I you know um, I don't remember doing all these things, but I did. You know, this was sort of my whole report, and I, I created a model for the space. Uh, uh, what the ventures were going to be like, hardware, software, biological, mathematical, et cetera, et cetera. And it's kind of cool to see uh, that thing because the the deep learning and now large language models that we're talking about are, are basically further generations of this kind of technology that's really um, eating our lives in some interesting way right now. And then last thing by way of check-in, um, I'm putting together a presentation I'd like to give a lot called Confessions of a Cyborg because I realized that 25 years worth of feeding this brain software, uh, I have an external mind that not a lot of humans have, and the experience of doing so is different and interesting, and I want to share that out. Um, and with that, I am complete for check-in. Yeah, I also wanted to pick up on where uh, Duck was going, but maybe on a more optimistic note. <clears throat> I'm a great fan of Spiral Dynamics because it is a communications tool that allows you to connect uh, across, um, across environments that you may not normally intuitively connect with. And I, I find <clears throat> such a challenge to convey to um, my uh, my friends in the regenerative uh, uh, movement, the Business to Sierra Club, or Regenerate America, or you know, any number of groups that I that I have attached myself to. Um, there is a a a, a, a type of knowledge missing. You know that you need to have to operationalize uh, what they're trying to do. So USDA, for example, right now just uh, set aside fifty-seven million dollars and has uh, a competition, national competition, going with groups that uh, are supposed to set up uh, local food hubs. Mm -hmm. And that all sounds great in principle, except that after spending unbelievable amounts of money over the last 20 years on food hubs they haven't achieved any kind of scale yet and there are good reasons for that so finally um i sat down with this gene yesterday and we had a conversation where i explained you know why uh the steps to operationalize um uh, this uh food movement are, are, are missing you know, uh, has has some significant gaps. So I, I'm sharing the conversation here, and I forwarded it to a group I've been working with, and there are farmers in there. And the farmer came back saying, "Yes, that's." I mean, he he confirmed the conversation as being relevant to what he's working on. So the the we we are working here in a theoretical world, you know, where. Um, we discuss concepts and we discuss uh, high level uh, outcomes, desirable outcomes. But it doesn't, there's no translation how that is actually supposed to work. So, when in this conversation, I'm getting like super technical down to the ground level of 
um, talking with um, someone in, in an operational environment, you know, as an assistant manager, a, a frontline worker, in, in order to you know, convey the, the uh, to, to make this challenge ahead more practical and tangible. Um, then I had another conversation yesterday with a friend of mine who is in the bright red, uh, bright blue, bright blue category. Um, and and what you would unkindly refer to maybe as a low information individual, but we have been friends for a long time. He's a super good guy, super smart, you know, worked as an airline uh, technician in the military. So really very smart on some levels, but then enthralled in this right wing network um, where you know he has uh, ideas about what is happening around him that that just um, that are just really startling. When I brought the conversation into his world um, and and refer to people who are um, not blessed with uh, a high IQ or with even a sufficient IQ to manage a, a credit card or to to accept right the bell curve and that on every uh, at every step of the right side of the bell curve there is a corresponding person on the left side you know struggling with a very basic uh, 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 challenges that life brings maybe you can't even, uh, sign a credit card, maybe maybe can't negotiate a contract, constantly gets uh, taken advantage of. And then you look at how our society is organized to be so predatory to people who, um, who are just not able to process what is going to happen to them. And then connect this with the conversation we had about indigenous wisdom and um, uh, living you know, in harmony with him, our society, but also with the world around us. <clears throat> and in the New Testament, it's blessed are the poor, right? The Beatitudes uh, that that uh, 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 should govern you know, our relationship to people less fortunate. And I would argue that in the indigenous cultures, that is the same principle you know, to to make sure that everyone is is taken care of. So when I talk with my friend who is very upset about all the money that's being given to people who don't have a job and who don't work, right? I'm saying, I mean, there are people who are incapable of working in a factory environment because factories today are high tech. And you have to be able to process, you know, some pretty complex things that, uh, in, in order to function there. So what are your options when, you know, you barely know how to read, maybe you're even illiterate, you know, when you, so when you look at this 10, 15% of the American population, of any population who are, who are so in need of help, are we really uh, a society that has any kind of empathy built into the way it functions, it interacts at that societal level. I mean, have we really taken care of of those less fortunate? Where are they supposed to go? What are they supposed to do? Right? And then you talk about, I don't know, I discussed with him, biblical concepts or cultural concepts of what other societies have been doing or, and are doing to create a harmonious way for everyone to live together. Um, he really responded to that. It made sense, you know, because it it uh, it captured this world. I put him into his work environment, and saying there are some people who obviously you couldn't have work for you because they just wouldn't be able to. They just couldn't get it right. So then, where are these people going? What are we doing with them? What's happening to them? How do you keep them safe, right? And how do you keep them from harming you know, the, the the everything around them? So anyway, those were the, the two conversations yesterday that uh, um, encouraged what I found encouraging in the way of reaching in you know, to to people who have such a hard time following what's going on around them and, and who are getting so frustrated and so angry because they just don't see any help coming at them.
<clears throat> Last night, I flew back to Colorado from Costa Rica, where I'd been uh, for the last month. Um, and it was a really interesting time to, I felt it was a very interesting time to experience a degree of simplicity, kind of forced simplicity that I had never, I have, I have not experienced before. Um, I was staying in the Guanacaste province in an area called Los Pargos, which is, uh, I was a, I was a bike ride away from where Todd Hoskins and Pia Hoskins were staying or living. So I got to spend some time with them, but it was um, the small community as uh, if you had read the, um, the newsletter that Todd had uh, sent from Costa Rica, hello from Costa Rica, he made the point that the roads aren't, um, they're not finished there. And the, he reflected on the wisdom of not having paved, finished roads. And that really stayed with me throughout the trip. And it was, it felt like an interesting time to be there as it seems like we are all collectively waiting with bated breath to, to see what happens next. And none of us really seem to have a pulse on what, what that's going to look like. Um, I was really present with this. It feels like a choice that I have, but it is also kind of sounds to me like an expression of, you know, the micro versus macro. This is choice of kind of a turning point. Do I turn towards simplicity? Do I intentionally, could I, what would it look like for me to divest myself of all of the things that I busy myself with? I'm sitting in an apartment right now with like, you know, 20 beautiful plant friends you know, and I have to, I spend a lot of time watering them and taking care of them. And I was, you know, it was in the bathroom last night and I was just struck by how many things are in the bathroom, how many things are in the apartment after staying in this, you know, place for a month where there was, there were not many things and there weren't many ways to get more things. Right. And I think I'm in reflection around that right now as my, my husband came down to check it out for a few days. Cause I had said, Hey, like, this could be a really cool place to live and he agrees. And so that's, that's a question in the air for us right now. Would we want to leave what we know in part to pursue um, mm. a space, a place to live where there is just more simplicity. And um, I was really struck by how healthy I felt in my time there, especially after having been so deeply connected with the, you know, just the, gorgeous raw nature that was um everywhere there um so yeah I'm, I'm in i'm in that right now i'm curious about this what to me feels like an opportunity kind of a conscious choice here as we are presented with more and more ways to make our lives i think some would like more simple but i think really the more appropriate word there might be more convenient which can mm -hmm. disguise itself as simplicity. And I don't think they're necessarily the same thing. Um, or do I turn away from convenience towards something that is closer to simplicity? How is my body? How does my mind? Um, how does my whole system respond to those directions? And it's, it feels like a scary thing to be considering. Um, so I'm in that, I'm in the, the exploration between these two, I feel like very, it's a very stark contrast between this, this world I've been in for the last 30 days and you know the world, I like the world, the space I'm coming back to and just noticing and observing what's changing, what's changed in me in this trip and how it feels to come back to a world or a, a world, a, uh, a space, a living space, a community where things are busy and there's a lot more going on. There are many, many, many more choices to make on any given day because there's so many more options. It's been interesting. That's where I'm, that's what I'm reflecting on right now. I am complete. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for that, Patty. Um, what you spoke about um, um, 
the life overwhelmed by things connected for me with uh, <clears throat> with what Doug said at the opening um, about uh, being overwhelmed in relationships. And I don't feel I, I don't have any concern about the idea space being overfull, uh, but I do feel about I do feel the thing space being overfull uh, in the life that I live. Um, and of course, uh, I, I share my life in my home with another person. So the boundaries of too much things or one of the right things is at all that is a very complicated game to sort out. Um, but what struck me in particular um, with Doug's share was uh, I feel both the richness of many relationships and uh, really inadequate at feeding and nurturing and living in those relationships enough i just like you know lots of little contact with lots of people in zoom space um and the busyness of life and not enough time just spent hanging with friends walking with friends sitting with friends and so forth uh, jerry when you spoke at the quaker meeting i i was reminded of the practice of some ancient jewish mystics to spend an hour or two before meditation preparing for meditation that's a wild idea to contemplate. Um, um, time capsule. I've been I've been in time capsule too, but I'm not going to go there. What's working me these days, Ken, to your question, uh, is the multiple legislative coups underway in the United States and around the world. Um, democracy being used to dismantle democracy. Uh, and I've long felt that part of the right wing strategy, at least in this country, is uh, is uh, is a deer in the headlight strategy is to throw stuff at us that is so insane and incredible that we just kind of look bug eyed and immobilized. Um, and I guess that's a way of saying that I don't. As we watch, you know, not only things like the gun legislation issue and the abortion issue, but the dismantling of checks and balances and giving tiny majorities the ability to take out court systems. Um, and uh, doesn't seem that we know much about what to do about that, except wait for the next election and hopefully win it. So that's working me a lot this week. Um, John, I think you can now see the screen, but I'm not sure. John asked me earlier to cue him when he was up. So you are, it is your turn. Great. Thank you, Jerry. And hello to everyone. Um, sorry, I haven't been able to be here often as I would like. Um, so this is going to sound, it's going to start sounding like it's technical, but it isn't. Um, there is a thing called the D-Web or the decentralized web. If you know this context, you can think of it as web three without corporations, without huge corporations and with very little, if any, uh, cryptocurrency. So those are big features of web three. That's what Meta is pursuing. And those are deliberately designed exclusions of the D-Web. Now the D-Web is kind of like, a, in scale, it's like the Quaker meeting. It's a very small group of people, but you know, the second week, the third week of June, probably gonna be 400 people from around the world, mostly from here, of course, showing up at Camp Navarro in Northern California to plan how to do a D-Web, you know? And there's lots of stuff, there's lots of versions. A lot of it's technical but a good third, or at least a quarter, at least a quarter of that activity will be about governance and about all the different ways in which we might uh, greater democratize our ways of coming together using the best features of technology and limiting some of the, trying to limit anyway, some of the uh, more dangerous features that we've been exposed to and and understand so it's it's a worthy effort i i don't really have a sense that it's going to succeed i i certainly hope it does i'm going to put my uh, energy into it i'm helping to organize a successor to uh <laughs> or let's say an integration of 
the live conversation cultural practices such as we have here with the, the digital support for those practices in a decentralized fashion, which is a pretty ambitious project. But the uh, people, if you've heard of the term holochain, those are some of the people that are involved and they really want to do the digital successor to the kinds of conversational practices that we might um, advocate. All right, so that's something I'm working on. Feel free to contact me if you'd like more information. I will look forward to uh, drawing on the great resources of this group uh, to help in that design. And uh, I guess I guess I have spoken. <laughs> Let's see. If you haven't checked in yet, please uh, consider doing so. <laughs> Meanwhile, we can stare at the crackling fire. Morning, all. Um, I don't have a big check-in today, or or maybe I have a check-in that's too big for today. Um, but but I uh, was just wandering uh, into the space that that Jerry left just now. Um, I wonder someday if we'll have check-ins where instead of I speak, I will ask somebody else a question instead. Thanks. There is general approval of your suggestion, Pete. Just pop it in to emphasize how much I love that idea. I am complete. Hello, everybody. What's on my mind that's worthy of serious conversation is where are we and how do we know? Um, there's an awful lot of bad news out there, a lot of stuff that's you know making headlines about how terrible things are. There's an awful lot of stuff out there that's going on that I think is really great that doesn't make the headlines that we don't hear about. Um, I've seen two pieces in the last few months about um, the off told tale that democracy is failing, but it's actually holding pretty steady according to the, the empirical evidence. Um, it's not that it's assured, but it's it's not as bad as what we're being told. So, you know, I'm aware that, um, uh, what's her name? Hannah, I was pronounced, mispronounced her name, Ar Ardent, Ardent. Um, she wrote about the, the origins of totalitarianism and how they would flood the idea space with bullshit. So no one would trust anything. Because if no one trusts anything, then you can um, you can take step in and take control and be the strong man and say, I'm in control. And so I'm really just curious of, you know, 
And I don't know that I'm still trying to figure this out for myself. How do I maintain balance and equilibrium in a space where there's all of this bullshit floating around? And I don't know what's trustworthy and what's not. Um, and my answer is I, I focus on what I know in my life, the people that I know, like you folks here and other communities I'm part of, who are really working hard to make the world a better place. And I put my attention there and I put my time and my effort there. Um, and I find myself reading more poetry and less news, which has actually been a tremendously helpful thing for me over the years. I do that pretty regularly. Like I get saturated with news and start to feel, oh my God, you know, this freaking world is just falling apart. Um, and uh, so I switched to poetry and it, it doesn't change the world, but it makes me feel better. Um, so I don't know. I'm just, this, this is on my mind of, of how do we know? where we are and, and what are we paying attention to and, and how are we allowing the external, the news of the external world to um, influence us in either positive, influence our moods to be either positive or negative, to be hopeful and aspirational and imaginative and ambitious and curious or to feel like we're constricted and, and falling apart and need to be defensive. Um, I'm aware that William Carlos Williams, who was an amazing poet said once, it's difficult to get the news from poetry, yet men die there. Men die every day for lack of what is found there. So just putting in a little boost for more poetry, less news. I'm complete. So Pete, as provocative as ever, I like your idea, as did Patty, I believe, about asking questions of others in the group. Um, I think it was Stacy who a while ago had said, hey, no one read my stuff. That was months and months ago. And it was something that I had noticed over the course of several years with the group was that we would jump on and talk about us. Here's what I'm doing. Reach out if you're interested. Here's what I'm doing. Reach out if you're interested. And I used to write that this was the one of the, the, the collections of biggest brains that I knew. And it's interesting, I think, that and maybe I'm missing this, that there, there's less, hey, you know what? I'm interested in that thing you just said, and not because I have something to say about it, but because I'm actually interested in learning more about whatever it was that you said. And not a simple, hey, plus one on that, but more like, hey, could you go deeper on that? Could you explain what you meant. Could you help me understand that a little better? And in the short space that we have, and with all of the important and personal things that we're working on, I think it can be hard to say, you know what, I want to give you more time. I want to actually not think about the thing I want to tell you, but have you explain the thing that you wanted to tell us, and we decided that we wanted to talk about our thing more. So I don't know, it's just a, an interesting thing. I'm loving the space, the pause. It is something I have only found in this community. I don't find it in a personal conversation. I don't find it in any other meeting call where there's an intentional pause to allow the thought to close, to allow the connections to be made in our own brain. And one of the things that shows up for me in those little pauses is what I think Pete might be referring to, which is that question. 
that question to say, you know, that's really interesting. Now that I'm pausing and thinking about what Ken just said, or about what Patty just said, or about what Doug just said, I'm actually thinking, you know, I have a, I have a question about that. I'd like to know more about it. And it, the pause can be a, a time to change subjects, but it can also be a time to engage with the subject. So I felt like that was worth at least thinking out loud on my own about. So I appreciate the space to do that. Did he? Yes. Rick, your, Rick, your mic is open, and uh, we have a couple people who haven't checked in yet, including Rick, um, and I'm going to hold this open for a second in case any of you would like to do so. If not, we will shift into conversation mode. I've got a brief minute. and. This has been an insane month for me. My dad's been in and out of the hospital three times. Uh, uh, currently in the rehab center for the second time, but he's doing pretty well. But we've been going through some things about um, <laughs> renovating the house in case we need to sell. And <laughs> so that's why I haven't been around for, for months. But um, And then a little bit of a pause today. And then we starting with... Uh, refinishing the hardwood floors tomorrow <laughs> so, but um yeah so i'm feeling some i'm feeling some relief <laughs> and stuff so i think um there's a way out of some of the quandary i've been quandaries i've been in so yeah I'm, may have to leave at any time though so i'll go ahead and hit the um, pause and stop video thank you carl I'll uh, check in. Hello, all. Um, I've uh, I've not been here as much of late, um, and uh, have also I've also been in um, dealing dealing with always sounds like such a funny funny term to me um uh but um engaging in some uh family stuff some parent care um some mm, home um you know dealing with homes and stuff and and um uh home care for my mother and um uh thinking about mortality and um and accumulation and um what matters um and it It's a sort of, uh, sorry, I'm a little, little inarticulate at the moment, but um, just this, the meaning of things, the meaning we attach to things, the meaning we attach to places, um, the, the substance of memories and, um, 
and then the relationship of all that to uh digital world and it and it comes back around to the um subject call that we had a couple of weeks ago three weeks ago four weeks i don't remember um and and thinking about all that we are um in physical space with physical stuff and all that we are in our digital space with our digital stuff um, and the challenges of of putting those things into some kind of harmony and some kind of um, shared benefit um, for people, which is a subject I guess I come back to in some of these calls um, about artifacts and archiving stuff. Anyway, that's my that's my check in. So thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, I think it's a good moment to shift and uh, go wherever we're inspired to go. So feel free to jump in, catch my eye. You can use the hand or just make a gesture, and I will play traffic control for the conversation again. I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear a little more from Doug about what he meant, because I think he's, he made it concise, which was appreciated. But I, I, I think some of the explanation was lost on me, at least. It, it... Doug, do you want to unpack what you said? Well, I'll try and keep it short. <laughs> uh... The idea, if you imagine a hundred people standing uh, fairly close together in a football field, uh, any one of them can move through the group with a little bit of resistance met along the way if the group is fairly tight. Now, imagine that each person of the hundred reaches out and holds on to the arm of the person next to them. It's no longer possible to move, just can't. And I'm thinking that that uh, with all of our human activity tends to create new relationships which become part of the momentum of not changing because we hold on to the relationships. So the idea is that uh, our intellectual activity slowly weaves a web of interconnectedness that makes it very hard to think outside of and eventually harder to think at all, at which point society is done. And maybe, I mean, my weird thought is that that is built into human nature. Uh, given our randiness and our curiosity, we're going to weave ourselves into uh, immobility. So the perverse extreme of the advice you just gave is to not enter any relationships or create any of those ties that bind, so to speak, because they're too constricting. I don't think that's what you mean. Well, in a way it is. And I'm saying that the sweet place for human life might be in things like the Enlightenment or what the Greeks did in Athens when things felt open and the things are closing in on us now. Interesting that you think that things felt more open in Athens or the Enlightenment than they did now. I imagine those people felt as traumatized by the change that they were going through as we do today. Who knows? I, I, I don't know, but, but uh, that's interesting. Does anybody, anybody else with thoughts on Doug's uh, comment? Otherwise, I'll go, I'll go back to the queue. Or Scott, if you yeah, want to inquire more. Okay, good. So the people I, in the I, queue. Go ahead. Well, no, I, I, I do. I didn't know if the hand raise was Q or responding to Doug. Uh, Gil, go ahead, and then I'll go to Patty. Yeah. Um, so, Doug, I'm I'm 
I'm provoked by your observation and troubled by it and wonder what if relationships are where everything comes from. And then constraining relationships means that nothing new happens, nothing new arises. I mean, you know, the ideas I have that I think are mine are not mine. They're expressed through me out of a lifetime of relationships and interaction and reading and thinking and, inter you know, and it, with other people. And I feel more enriched by these relationships than constrained. I don't have any sense of, um, you know, um, among the worlds that we're hanging out in of, of the, of the constraint on ideas. I mean, I know there are people out there who want to, you know, uh, very directly and effectively constrain the generation of new ideas, but I'm not sensing that comes from the richness of interaction. So um, back over to you. Can you say more? Let me add just one comment. If you're part of a startup, uh, in the next months, you're going to want to do things that keep that startup going and thriving. Sure. Because of that, you're less available for new initiatives around climate change. So you be part of the momentum that keeps things from changing. And since everybody more or less is doing that all the time, the network of relationships gets tighter and tighter. But that's not a function of relationships. That's a function of the priorities that I choose to focus on. I mean, if my focus is climate change, I only I'm only effective on that in relationships. Whether it's you know whether it's a climate tech startup or a legislative initiative or, you know, uh, uh, getting people in the streets, what have you. It's I, I'm 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 more baffled than I was when you started. In in. Doug's favor, I'll point to groupthink, which is a thing that happens sure. to groups of people who are too tightly correlated <clears throat> and whose incentive systems forbid them from stepping out of the norms of their thinking, et cetera, et cetera. So I can see that that, that, that happens a whole lot in our lives. And sure, and but that's not that's not a but that's not a that's not a a function of relationships. That's a kind of relationship. It's a kind of relationships don't relationship. dictate relationships don't dictate groupthink. Exactly. Uh, Patty. But sometimes we have groupthink and sometimes we have creative ferment. I mean, look at look at this group here. Here there there is a certain amount of groupthink, but it's not tight and constraining. And and the commonalities that we share uh, are 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 a fertile ground for generative thinking as well. And you know, uh, would we want to not have more people join this conversation? I don't think so. I mean, there's a, you know there there's a limit beyond which it becomes unwieldy and wants to bud. Uh, but I'm feeling more the richness of con of relationship rather than the constraint. And I, I I don't mean to debate it, but I really wanted to hear Doug how you how you came to this, and I appreciate it, and I and I remain baffled. Patty, go ahead. Thanks for your patience. Yeah. Yeah. Super interesting, Doug. I felt really confronted by by that invitation, and and then I started um, engaging with the something I'm observing in in my own life. It's it is a uh, group of people I know very well, loved ones, who are um, building a. Uh, it's it's my language is like a familial compound. It's it's a lot of my relatives are. Um, uh, and my Lebanese family side of things are building, have bought a large swath of land and are building houses um, in this land. And it, it's it's this, it's going to be this neighborhood of family members who have lived in, and this isn't, I'm going to acknowledge, I, I don't mean this to sound um, judgmental, but but the, you know, one of the the realities of, of that is that they have lived in the same place for uh, in the same, around the same people for their entire lives. And they're going to continue to build family. There are um, you know, people my age who are having kids who are going to be raised in this, you know, familial neighborhood. And I was really intrigued by this. Uh, I, this isn't your language, Doug, but it, it sounded like this invitation to consider this possible evolutionary gridlock that might happen as Jerry was suggesting kind of in these places where echo chambers and groupthink can become um, a little more easily, uh, say, indoctrinated into, right, but um, uh, a part of. And so I 
I, I would think what I come back to, and I hate to sound like a broken record bringing this back in, but like, I just, I think of, you know, what is the difference between, what are the differences between a group like the one we're in right now and other spaces and places where that uh, evolutionary gridlock um, might present itself a little more clearly and they can't help but feel that the, I don't want to keep calling it emotional maturity, but but the the tools and the skills we have to connect, right? So I think that something I, I witness in that cohort um, of community, that family I have is that their, their means of connecting is through the news, right? And talking about the news. And I don't, I don't often witness um, more vulnerable or emotionally based connection happening in that cohort, right? So I, I kind of wonder how much does the ability to communicate the skills and the tools we have or do not have to connect impact what it is that you are suggesting and the possibility of this restriction in relationship rather than growth in relationship with others. And I feel complete with that. Thanks, Patty. Um, I'm, I'm noting that it's really easy to be comfortable in groups like we're comfortable in this group and that one of the things Stacy does as her method of opera, modus operandi is to make sure she's talking to people who are not like her and who don't believe the things she believes so that she can try to bridge those gaps and figure out what's going on. And, and um, I think that that breaching of the bubble uh, that we're each that we each construct that feels cozy and comfortable and safe is important as well, like really important. And maybe a piece, Doug, of the binding that you're that you're describing is that is the is the fact that it binds us inward instead of uh, reaching outward. Uh, but I'm not sure. I don't want to put words in your mouth. Uh, Doug, then Ken. There's a. Uh, anthropocentric um, sort of center in your share, Doug, that um, I wonder whether it's possible to transcend out of. Um, we exist as a species. Um, and if if I concede that um, we're not separate and apart and isolated from the rest of the planet and the biome and everything else on it, um, part of the, the the implication in your share is that there's a constraint and limitation. Um, by virtue of um, aggregating around a commonality, a, a point of focus or commonality by and between a group of people. And in there is choice, individual choice and agency. Um, the thing that, uh, that can, that I convert your your share into is is the living part of it, which is um, is the dynamic, the energetic flows by and between individuals and projects with other projects and all of the rest. Are they flowing or are they not? Is it living or is it not? And um, if things are living and they're thriving and they're growing in service to the good and service to healing and solving problems and all of the rest, then, um, you know, that's a good thing. And if it's not, why isn't it? Um, and density as a fat as a sort of de facto attribute of a group of people consolidating more strongly. Um, I'm not sure is a factor in whether things are flowing in and out of that, uh, whatever that center of gravity is, 
um, that there are other things afoot in terms of what stops flow and what what uh, enables it or restores it um, from a generative standpoint. So um, I just throw that out into the mix um, because elementally, um, where most, most of the things I touch and experience are stuck in the mental body and they're not fully integrated and flowing across all of the elements that reality is comprised of. Um, so from it, you know, the, the underlying inquiry for me is, is something, you know, purpose-driven or not, doesn't mean everything has to be, but if it is or purports to be, um, is it flowing toward fulfilling its purpose, like generating something, manifesting something, contributing value? Um, but uh, yeah, that was my share. And, and unfortunately, I got to go, but I love this session. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Mr. Hummel, the floor is yours whenever you want. I think we're probably all old enough to remember those um, wooden boxes that had a handle on uh, two sides and there was a maze on top with holes and a steel marble and you had to navigate, you know? And I feel like that's my life today. Like I'm... the the ground is constantly tilting and there's these holes and I have to like scoot around to one side and get out on that, you know? And, and um, I don't know why this, this, this image came to me when, when Doug was speaking about um, relationships with people. And, and so I'm just wondering how to, um, th there are relationships that are amazingly helpful for getting around those holes and, and sticking, you know, uh, getting through that. But I think we we need to learn how to coordinate better to tilt the the floor to help us move so that we don't fall into those holes. And one of the holes is when people start to hold too tightly, um, and another is when they when they detach and they they just lose interest and don't care and wander off. And um, I don't know. I, I don't. I just this this image came to me. I wanted to share it because it it feels so real. Of um, life today is, is the ground is constantly shifting, and um, I look for ways to keep myself uh, in balance. Um, Labyrinth balance boards, yeah. Anyway, thank you. If you Google that, you can buy some on Etsy. Just saying. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, April wrote a book called Flux, Eight Superpowers for Thriving Amid Constant Change back in 2021. It seems to be a timely topic. And one of the things is how do you maintain a sense of orientation, stability, whatever, while adapting and while sort of surfing the waves of change or whatever metaphor you want to apply. Um, and uh, one of the things that she presents is a concept out of yoga called the drishti, which is basically a, a, a point to focus on outside of yourself when you're holding difficult, like one-legged poses. And the drishti is, uh, is uh, you sort of use soft gaze to, to pick a spot, but that spot helps ground you in your balance. And so metaphorically, what sorts of things in our days or lives or associations can we point to and refer to or use as those balance assists? Uh, and sometimes that's just your daily ritual. I mean, I, I, I work when I worked for Esther, like she swims every day. She swims every morning of her life, if she possibly can. One of the hardest things her assistant had to do was source a pool in the middle of uh, Russia after the former Soviet Union had become former, or in Slovenia or Slovakia, or name your, name your former Soviet satellite, uh, sometimes involving bribing a guard or whatever else. But that was, but that was her rooting thing, and she would be at her desk early in the morning having swum an hour. 
Uh, and I could see easily how that was uh, very much a rooting thing for her. Um, so so I, I think we each need to figure out for our place in the world and what we're trying to get done, how to find those things. Because uh, at the start of this call, I was talking to Pete about my experiences with ChatGPT. And one of the questions I asked him early on as the ChatGPT thing were on is like, are you having boundary issues? Because as I ask these questions and think about my relationship to the intelligence that seems to be in the cloud now, I don't know sometimes where I end and it starts. And that's a little scary. So that the, the, this, so some of this is about what are you standing on? Some of this is about where, does you, where do you end and the next thing begin? I don't know. There's a lot of cool stuff afoot right now. Um, Gil asks in the chat, Drishti, sometimes soft focus can be more focusing than maniacal focus. Absolutely. And sometimes soft eyes or soft focus let you see the things you couldn't see before. A simplest example here might be, and this, this, uh, when you have, if you have a Christmas tree and you're putting lights on it, the best way to figure out if the lights are doing okay is to squint. Because when you squint, you actually see whether your lights are kind of balanced or not, and you can move them around to make them work. Maybe a silly example, but but um, but there's we have sort of lots of workarounds like that in our lives. But but soft focus sometimes is the the, the way to see things. Yeah, another example out of martial arts, which you know, Jerry and I share the practice, is that if somebody grabs you, say somebody grabs you by the wrist and holds tight, if you focus on the grab, you're immobilized. And if you let go of the focus on the grab and focus on the whole body or the whole relationship of the two of you, you can move and do something with it. And we, it's very easy for us to get really focused on the thing that's right in front of us and challenging us and you know, not be able to see and not be able to move. One of the, Aikido I, I is my sport, and one of the important notions in Aikido is the sense of connection between uke and nage, and those are the two roles. And Aikido is always a partner thing. It's not, it's not usually people performing some kind of routine. It's usually partners working together. And that sense of connection and the sense of deep connectedness, like, like, mm -hmm. There, there's a grip, but it's not an iron grip. And uh, the way I try to sort of coach it is I want to be able to feel your, your far foot from your wrist. Mm. I, want, mm. I want to feel my way through all of your body mm. so that you're, so mm. that it's not just your hand grabbing my wrist, but rather I, we are connected in some, in some way. And it's very much about partnership. And the, the closer mm. you get to that, the better your Aikido is. It's very, it's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes I go to class and I come out feeling like a beginner. And I don't mean that in beginner's yeah. mind in, in a good way. I mean, like, holy hell, have I not learned anything? Pete, wow. That, that, that's how I felt the first day on the mat after I earned my black belt. It was like, what the hell is going on here? No idea. The question motivated my thinking about uh, the tightening of uh, our community to the point where we can't move is I, I feel like humanity does not have the skills right now to think of how to organize itself to deal with climate change. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in things that we've missed along the way that could possibly help out. And if there is a tendency for everything to get tight, is there in that? some hint at how to deal with climate change. Uh, I don't see it yet, but that's what's uh, driving my thinking and pushing me to the boundaries of things I've thought before. Um, Doug, one thing that I hear a bunch is like, nobody knows the answer to X, like on, on whatever. And what I noticed from historic patterns is that often a whole bunch of people were yelling loudly before the event happened, and they were right in retrospect. It's just that nobody was listening to them. So my take, this is a little bit like the Library of Babylon, like Borges' short story, where somewhere in there is the index to the whole library. So there's a, there's a gang of people who are actually running down all the halls looking for the index, because when you get the index, you control the world. But, but the idea that there are people who 
have a grasp on how to deal with climate change and have really good advice. We're just not all collimated or congruent in uh, agreeing with them in some way that works at a very large scale. But I think, but I think, I think it's not that nobody knows. And that, that, this is just my own my own take on it. It's not that nobody knows. It's that we're not agreed on who might know and what to do about it together. And that for sure we're in lockup there. Um, but for every for every for every crisis or whatever that's come up, whether it's the the dot com fiasco, the uh, Bitcoin meltdown, the you know what what have you, um, uh, and reading the Big Short uh, by Michael Lewis is a really good way to to see this. There were you know six people he found who had slightly different explanations for how this was clearly a bubble, and then invested against it and and profited from it at great personal cost because they would never want to replicate the experience because everybody hated them during the whole process. Sorry, that was like five tangents at once. Stacy, then Pete. Yeah, um, it, this is a huge topic, but I just want to touch upon the part, Doug, where you said about being able to organize, because I think that's the real problem beyond climate change. And I think it's something that we might be touching upon in Society 2045, which is dealing with force, because I think part of that problem has to do with the gatekeeper, the gatekeepers and people who are already in power holding on to that power. And I'm talking about even within a group, a small group. So I'm not talking about some overlords. I'm just talking about the way people in general and their daily goings on, the way they make decisions for other people and don't necessarily let people move and mingle in a way that would be best. So it could be something as simple as somebody in, in a workplace not letting other people know what their job is because they want to remain valuable, that kind of a thing. So I think there's something to be said in how people organize, but there is something behind human behavior that impacts that. And I think that force and that filter, which again, much bigger topic for now, but that's just the direction I want to throw a dart in. I, I like Doug's, Doug's provocation and it doesn't end. Without disagreeing, I, I have to say it doesn't, it doesn't feel, it doesn't ring doesn't harmonize quite for me. And maybe maybe I'm just not harmonic to it. Um, the, my, um, and, and Doug, I like the way you said, um, I feel like humanity doesn't have the skills right now to think of how to organize itself to deal with climate change. And kind of, you know, observationally, that's definitely true. But I think, I think it attributes to humanity something that we, uh, uh, a tribute to individual humans. So, hmm. you know, as a human and as a set of humans grouped together to do things, I know that I have agency to decide what, what to do. And with a small set of humans, I can kind of get a group thought, maybe not group think, but a group thought of, hey, we should do this or we should do that and we can do it together. We can decide to do it together. I think we are fooled by that observation from uh, our, our head and our brain and our eyes into thinking that that's the way humanity works. And I think that humanity at scale is an emergent property of you know, millions, hundreds of and thousands and millions and billions of people bumping into each other. And, and the, the emergence properties thereof are like, it, it's not that humanity organized itself that way, or crucially that it could organize itself or part of humanity could organize itself to confront that emergent super superstructure, super being. Um, it's, it's more complicated than that, I think. So it doesn't feel to me like we have relationship gridlock. 
and I think it feels to me like what you're observing is a real thing, but it's the the physics, the multi-body physics problem of millions of people in billions of people and millions of of subgroups bumping into each other in in ways that are really hard to understand. And Jerry, I like your your example of um, the folks who bet against conventional wisdom. And even in that lesson, the le lessons like those are kind of a, in arrears. Um, in any chaotic situation, you can go back at, in an after action review and say, hey, look, these six people knew what was happening. And I think really what happened is they had, you know, for whatever reason, they were bucking conventional wisdom and, and were committed to do that, um, to see it through, even though it was really painful. So it's easy for us to attribute kind of thought and foresight to that when it's probably just kind of, you know, somebody was going to be crazy enough to, to be the winners um, in it. I, the, I'm, I'm always, I, I try to be a tiny bit as smart as uh, Taleb. Um, Taleb is kind of a um, seesaw character. He's he's got a lot of a lot of good things and a lot of bad things. Um, but but I really like the way he said uh, what he said about black swans. Um, you know, it's 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 something that like. Or, or the, the, I guess the thing he says in Pulled by Randomness, you know, it's really easy for people to attribute structure and intent and things like that from, back to my point, from kind of an individual or small group perspective. And the world is just more complicated and more chaotic than you, you can imagine. And it's so complicated and chaotic that you can't imagine it. And then you start to try to shape it into something that does make sense, right? So I, I, I worry that, I, I worry when we think we can organize to confront climate change. And certainly some of us, different groups of us can organize to confront climate change, but that's not the same as humanity confronting climate change. And the groups that self-organize in smaller, smaller ways to do that are going to have a really difficult time, maybe an impossible time, confronting all of the chaos and, and emergence in the larger sphere of humanity itself. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. Um, I will reveal my preference for, my non-surprising preference for narrative here by saying that mm. sometimes the narratives that are basically flimsy impressionistic framings of the situation carry the day and cause people to join a movement or not join a movement or believe something or not believe something. And it can be as dysfunctional as QAnon or as functional as uh, regenerative, the regenerative economy. <clears throat> and that those framings really are important because I've said before, my one of my amateur beliefs about history is that history is a battle, a fight over the joystick in the cockpit of humanity over which narratives dominate the majority of humans outside. And so, so I think that, that I, unfortunately, I'm, I may be overloading them, but I think these narratives are, are, are huge and play a really strong role uh, and are mixed in with the fact that we are illiterate, innumerate, uh, don't understand large numbers, don't understand exponential change. There's like countless, countless ways in which we're, we're foolable and are busy fooling ourselves. Um, but a piece of that is, is the, the, the freight of narratives. Uh, Kim, sorry, over to you. So I, I get interested in Einstein's famous quote about can't solve problems at this level of thinking that created them. He never said that. It's actually from a New York Times editorial. And I changed one word. So see if you can spot the word that I changed. Our world faces a crisis as yet unperceived by those possessing the power to make great decisions for good or evil. 
The unleashed power of the Anthropocene has changed everything, save our models of thinking, and thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. We need to let people know that a new type of thinking is essential if humankind is to survive and move towards higher levels. That's from 1946, May 25th, 1946. The word I changed was Adam to Anthropocene. Uh, yes, got that. Um, hmm. So, but Einstein didn't actually, he was trying to raise $200,000 to um, uh, start a program that would train people to think differently. But I don't know that how much he, he, how much progress he made on that. And I think we're up against a massive group think dominated by an economic paradigm, dominated by uh, neoliberal economics that says we don't have the money to save the world to deal with climate change. It's going to cost too much. You know, and um, that's trying to solve the problem of climate change with the exact same materials that created it. It's never going to work. So I threw the Tyson Young Caporta quote in there that he talks about solutions to complex issues like climate change require multiple diverse minds. And, you know, I come back as a facilitator to how do you get enough representation in the room from enough diverse peoples where you can start to create new ways of coping with climate change, new ways of seeing it. And I think it's going on in lots of places in the world. I don't think it's hooked up into a coherent movement yet, but I feel like it's getting close. Um, you know, look at what Greta Thunberg, one girl sitting down outside her school has sparked a worldwide movement. There is massive fomentation afoot and it's hard to know the state of it. But, you know, when I look at the big picture of humanity, I see if everyone woke up tomorrow fully enlightened, there's enough suffering in process already that it would continue for many, many decades, if not several hundred years. So I don't expect to see this thing shift too radically, too quickly, but I trust in evolution. I really don't think that whatever brought human beings into existence is going to, um, we, we have the ability to take ourselves out of the picture. But I think we're ultimately going to wake up and find out that we have some level of collective intelligence that is kicking in at the survival level of we have to work together now. Um, we've got to become a succession species rather than a pioneer species. We have to learn to cooperate with each other and, and um, work within the boundaries of the Petri dish in which we find ourselves. And I, I trust that. I, th I have a deep, deep trust in that. I have also a deep, deep trust that there's going to be enormous suffering along the way. And it's really hard to hold those two, but that's what I have to do. Um, otherwise, I go into a despair cycle and I, I just can't be there. So thank you. So given the time, I'm not going to let the silence swallow it up too much. Uh, I'm going to give an example that's sort of to the side. And that is, in Patty's description of her family, building houses in a community. That's a project they're going to want to make succeed and they will fight against things that are trying to prevent it. The problem is that that building activity creates CO2 and cutting the trees for the wood, mining the metals for the copper, uh, lots of things, uh, the transportation of materials, transportation of workers, uh, the fact that we're in a contradiction there between what we want and what we want, uh, climate change solutions and building our communities, is part of the trap that we're in that we're going to have to think our way out of. Thanks, Doug. Um... Gil, and then we're getting near the end of our session. Scott, thanks for what you just posted to the chat. Um, and Stacy, you wanted to, to help us wrap this session with something. So I'll go to you if, if that's wrapping up this conversation. But Gil, the floor is yours. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief two things. <clears throat> um, Ken, what you call neoliberalism, I call capitalism with a hyphen. Um, and the people who are saying we can't afford to solve this are saying, I don't want you to use my money to solve your problem, which is actually our problem, but they, you know, somehow <laughs> exempt themselves from that. Um, 
Um, and, uh, and I don't expect that suffering ends in 10 years or hundreds of years. Suffering is, in, is an endless part of the human experience. And as the Bodhisattva vow or the Bodhicitta, I guess, says, I, I vow to put an end to it anyway. But we live in that contradiction. And I'll, I'll leave it there. And Stacy, to you. Yes, I want to read something I wrote 25 years ago. Um, I usually don't because my writing's so simple, but Joanne, Pete's wife, has encouraged me, and it kind of fits the beginning part of this call. It's called Thank You. Thank you. Thank you to the one who held the door for me the other day. Thank you to the driver who waved me on ahead of him, to the woman who complimented me on my hair, to the one who stared a momentary glance, expressing to me that she had acknowledged my thought. Thank you to the one who let the door drop in my face, reminding me how often I forget about others. Thank you to the driver who cut me off, helping me remember how often I rush through life thoughtlessly. To the woman who stared at my hair and then turned away, allowing me to feel the judgment of another. And to the one who never lifted her eyes to meet mine for even a moment, I know how it feels not to trust. I am grateful to all of you for you have all served me well. I am here but to learn about myself, for only when I know who I am can I love myself for who I am, and only when I love myself can I truly love you, and that is what I most want to do. Only love is real, only love will survive. Please help me to remember this, to know that my worst enemies are on a soul level my truest friends. It is a painful task to hurt one you love, but we are here to learn and a teacher is needed for every lesson. Help me to remember that I am a student and life has been created to guide me toward self-knowledge. It was my desire to enter this school. Together, we have all made this decision to learn. Graduation is upon us and the success of our class as a whole will impact our individual achievement. We are a team. When one heals, we all heal. Support each other encourage each other, and tolerate our different ways of approaching a challenge. We are each unique, and we each bring a gift to the total essence of who we are. We are one, you and I. We are love. We are God. Nothing else is real. Thank you. I got to run. See you next week. Thanks, everybody. Um, thank you, Stacy. That was awesome. Um, you reminded me of one of my favorite poems, which I will put a link to in the chat. It's long, so it's not a, it's not a read here, but I just adore this poem. It's called a uh, catalog of unabashed gratitude by Ross Gay. Stacy, can you share a source to what you read? I wrote that. I wrote you it 20 wrote years ago, yep. yeah. Awesome. Can you share that then? I would have to type it. I would have, yes, I, I will. I will type some, it. Some, someday, I, somehow, no I pressure. Would love to, I have to tell you, Gil, it's really interesting because I have my writing in a folder of just scraps. And it's like, I don't have a lot of writing, but the ones I have just seem to be all I need. <laughs> So thank you for asking. I would love to send well, it to you. Don't, don't feel a need to type it. Just, you know, take a photo of it and send that or whatever's easy for I'm you. I'm going to um, use Otter. <laughs> can, I, can, I, can I comment on that, Gil? I, I, I definitely agree with you. Just take a photo of it. Um, and I'll give you a specific reason why. I read recently about the change where we're not teaching cursive anymore. Mm -hmm. And you can feel how you want to feel about that. But one result from that that I had not anticipated was that we've lost signatures. Yeah. So young people would no longer have a signature that is theirs be, that evolves from their own unique cursive writing. And any uh, teacher who teaches cursive knows that by the end of the first year of teaching cursive, they can identify every person's paper yeah. simply by their handwriting. Mm -hmm. And so I would say that your handwriting on that, if it was handwritten, I typed it. Uh, but I, yeah. It, oh, oh, I'll, I'll continue the thought. Is 
is is a is a valuable part of it because it is it is that unique part that's that's you mm -hmm. and i feel like this loss of signature is a loss mm -hmm. of something that we haven't it parallels other losses that are similar that loss of of individuality that mm -hmm. i think is so important Scott, if, if i may i'll add to that because it's not just the signature it's the it's the body mind um i, I write in at least five different modes um I write, you know, by hand, I type on a keyboard, I type with my thumbs, I write on a whiteboard, uh, and I dictate while walking. And I find that my thinking and my voice are really different in each of those modes because of how my body is engaged in it. So not just the signature, I think there's something very important there that maybe is being lost. Yeah, thank you. This came up in a conversation yesterday. <laughs> hmm. um, and women have definitely noticed that we need to write and move and have that mm -hmm. arm movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very yeah. interesting. Very good. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you all. You. See you next time. Thank you.